I want to just take some time to share just a little bit of food for thought with you all and to kind of go into a, a discussion about surviving the holidays, right? Uh, and, and I think, inshallah, from this discussion, we'll be able to have like a great deal of benefit for our own personal reflection, as well as our own uh, practices during this time of the year. Bismillah wa salatu wa salam ala rasulillah wa ba'd. The first thing is, every year around this time, uh, for different collegiate MSAs, for different Islamic schools, and for different uh, masajid, I've always done this Truth About Holiday series. It goes back like five years, where do the truth about Halloween, the truth about Christmas, truth about New Year's, truth about Thanksgiving, truth about Valentine's Day, uh, St. Patrick's Day, and all of these uh, holidays, the five major holidays being Halloween, Thanksgiving, Christmas, New Year's, and Easter as well as some of those hallmark holidays like St. Patrick's Day, uh, St. Valentine's Day, uh, Labor Day, or not Labor Day, Memorial Day, 4th of July, birthdays, Mother's Day, Father's Day, things like that. Um, and they're not all the same. Uh, all, of all the things that I mentioned, even anniversaries, they're not all the same. Uh, these types of uh, festivities, they're not equal. And giving greetings for some things versus others, they're not equal either. And sometimes like we make the discussion so much about intention, religion, and history that we lose sight of the reason why we do some things and why we abstain from others. And, and all of those things go back to submission to Allah, seeking Allah's pleasure, and, and wanting to, to live a life that is pleasing to him, subhanahu wa ta'ala, because we know that this is the key to our ultimate success and the key to our ultimate happiness. So one question that I always ask in these Truth About Holiday series is, if one partakes in an action, right, if someone is doing something, but they're unaware of its implications, does the intention save them from the results or purposes of said action, right? So if I do something on Halloween, but I'm not aware of Sam Hain or All Saints Day or All Hallows Knees or the Celtic paganism and how Christianity melded with it and how it came to the United States through the Irish during the potato famine in the 1700s, if I'm not aware of any of those things, right? And I just, I just go trick-or-treating. If I do that action, but my intention is just for the candy, does it mean that I'm free from the pagan origins of it or the purpose that, that the dressing up and the jack-o'-lanterns and all this stuff came from? Now, many people will probably say yes, right? But it's your intention that counts. And we like to say these types of things, right? But the hadith of Umar ibn al-Khattab, where he said, the Prophet wasallam said, that all of your actions are nothing but their intentions and that you will get from your actions what you intend. We cannot make up the definition of intention. And we cannot make up what, what intention will be accepted by Allah and what intention will be rejected by Allah. The answer to what niya is and the answer to what is required to intend in the first place is something that we have to have a, a basic understanding on before we can even intend for anything, especially if we want to intend something for the sake of Allah, or at least intend something so that we do not do something that's displeasing to Allah. Now, we know that it's not just enough to have intention, but also that your intention has to be sincere. It has to have ikhlas to it. So when we start talking about sincerity and the people who are sincere, the mukhlasin, as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioned in Surah Al-Hijr in the 15th chapter, and as Allah mentioned also in Surah Saad um, in the 38th chapter of the Quran, that, uh, that shaitan will have power over everyone from the children of Adam, except for the mukhlasin, except for the people who are sincere. That means that it becomes our objective in one surah that every Muslim, uh, one of the first surahs that a, a new Muslim learns is Surah Al-Ikhlas. It's one of the rare chapters in the Quran where the, where the common title of the chapter is actually not from a word that's found in the surah. If you recite Surah Al-Ikhlas from A to Z, you will never find the word Ikhlas in any form because the entire chapter is about sincerity to what it means to believe in the one true God, and that is Allah. So when it comes to having sincere intention, that means that we have to have knowledge and we have to have understanding. That means that we have to be uh, educated. We need ta'nim, we need education. And we also need to be guided to the correct understanding of something in order to attain tafheem, a, a clear insight of what it is that we're doing. So can we make those things up? Can we make up what action uh, 
according to my Nia, is free from the implications and ramifications of it? And can I make up when my sincerity will be accepted by a law and when it cannot? Or is this something that we need to learn? Whenever you break it down like this, it becomes very, very clear that uh, intending is something that we need to learn. So one of the greatest hurdles that any convert like goes into is submission. It's probably the biggest hurdle that every single new Muslim has to overcome, submitting to a law 100%. And this is why I know after I took my shahada, I didn't practice Islam for a year afterwards. In fact, the way that I found out that I should be practicing the religion was like through a crazy situation that involved a lot of haram things, you know? Uh, sometimes like the way that a, a convert gets to the point where they finally are like, oh, I can't just say I'm Muslim. Oh, I can't just make this stuff up anymore. I actually have to like practice this religion. That can be the biggest hurdle to overcome. But how submission is actualized, whether you're a born Muslim who goes on the journey of finally coming to faith, like one of my, my best friends or like easily my best friend, uh, he's a, a, a brother who grew up in a Muslim household but did not convert or begin to practice the religion until he got into like college, right? Where he really started to understand the deen and really uh, began to practice it. And in the same, same journey that, that people who come from born Muslim households go through, same journey that we as converts have to go through as well. Being a new Muslim sometimes, the reason why like submitting can be a big hurdle is because as a convert, sometimes the uh, Muslim community, the born Muslim community or the collective community as a whole, can treat you as if like you did not have a life before Islam. So you're a new Muslim, you don't know anything. But as I mentioned at the beginning of this lecture, your experience is your expertise. So it's not like you don't have life skills or practical knowledge of so many different things, right? <laughs> Sometimes being a new Muslim, it doesn't mean that you have to turn off your whole old life and your old understanding of things just because people treat you like a baby. Oh, you've only been Muslim for two years, oh, like a little baby. Like, no, <laughs> no, that's not the case. But at the same time, sometimes as a convert, we lean so heavily on our old life and our old way of understanding things, using our own deductive reasoning to, uh, to analyze what we can and can't do, kind of maybe that Christian mentality or that secular mentality or that liberal mentality of, oh, it's just what you think, it's just what you feel, it's just, oh, you know, well, in my heart, for my Islam, you know, whenever I'm ready, I will pray. Like sometimes we take that type of mentality into the deen, but the deen is not like that. Your newfound lifestyle is important to you, right? And that's the reason why sometimes you see converts, they rush into the deen and the brothers grow a big beard and the sisters like, I want to be Nikabi. And just like you see them do all of the, they turn the entire wardrobe into black clothes, you know, and you see them rush into all of this stuff, right? But your, while your newfound lifestyle is super important to you, it, it could be and will probably be and is most certainly odd to everyone else. Born Muslims who see new Muslims practicing the religion, brother, you know you don't have to wear a thobe, sister, you know you don't have to wear black. You know, sometimes uh, that can be one side of it, but definitely for our non-Muslim family members, definitely for our coworkers uh, who see, you know, start to wear hijab or I don't uh, go to the bar after work anymore and stuff. This can be very, very odd. And the time of the year that these things are accentuated and highlighted the most is during the holiday season. Uh, no matter how long you've been Muslim, every time we make the whole, like the full circle right back around to this time of the year, this gets highlighted again. And that's why these conversations are always going to be revived. In a, uh, in a, in a session that we did on revert realities uh, with Sister Nahila, uh, Brother Daniel, and uh, the other sister's name escapes me. Please remind me, inshallah. Uh, in that, in that uh, revert realities uh, session that we had, I gave an analogy of ice sculpting. When it comes to sharing your religion, sharing your practices with people, sometimes it's like, uh, you know, if, if, you're, if you're sculpting ice, if you use a sledgehammer, you'll completely shatter it. But if you use a toothpick, you'll get nowhere. You know, if you come in with your fatwa hammer saying, oh, I can't eat any of this stuff anymore, and no trees, and no, you're just going to completely break it. But if you just sit in there and, you know, nice and timid, and yeah, I'm back, I'm just wearing this thing on my head now. <laughs> Yeah, I won't drink the eggnog. I know you spike it every year, mom. Ha, ha, ha. You know, <laughs> if, if you take that toothpick approach, then you'll get nowhere. And we want to empower every Muslim, regardless of their background, regardless of how they came to faith, to be firm in their identity. Not feeling like you have to compromise and not feeling like you have to force it down other people's throats. That people can respect you for who you are and that you can be comfortable practicing who you are. So this can be the dichotomy of the, of the convert. 
on one side of the spectrum, some converts, they come in and they're very headstrong and they're very determined and they bring that fetal hammer and I don't do this anymore and I, this is wrong. But you can see how this can make a lot of people burn out. It can make oh, them the burn out spiritually, but it can also burn out relationships very, very fast. It can burn out relationships with your family. It can burn out relationships with your friend. It can burn bridges, right? Mm-hmm. And it can burn you out. But the other side of that, the, the other side of that dichotomy is that timid and unsure convert. You know, uh, we're in a chat and mashallah, a sister, uh, you know, she, she was wearing hijab in public for the first time. Because uh, wearing the hijab, even as a man who wears stove in public and stuff like this, it's not something that's easy. You know, uh, I, I, I dress like this because I'm comfortable in it. But to go from, you know, dressing one way your entire life to dressing another, it can make you very, very timid. It can make you very, very unsure. And so you silence and mute your Muslim identity and you, and you take this mentality of, I just need to take my time. I need to take my time to pray. I need to take my time to wear hijab. I need to take my time to practice the faith. But take your time until when, right? Uh, just like how, you know, the fatwa hammer effect of just coming in and smashing everything, slowing things down. Okay, well, when do I pick my spot? We have to be able to reconcile the practice of our deen and a fear of how people will, will respond to it through the lens of our religion, not through the lens of anyone else's paradigm. Because whenever we are raised before Allah, we will only be asked uh, uh, about, uh, about what we did with regards to our knowledge of him, subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you don't want to be in a position where you're just making that up and just doing whatever you want. Oh, you know, my parents or, you know, my family or, you know, these people, they say this. No, 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 no. We, we have to be able to reconcile those practices and, and, and kind of get past some of these fears that we have of being accepted or people not accepting who it is that we, uh, what it is that we are, which is Muslims. So this requires a higher order of thinking, right? We have to make sure that our knowledge is through an Islamic paradigm, not through, an, uh, you know, a, a personalized one. And we also have to be empathetic of different people's experiences. Some people, it's very, very hard for them to practice the religion. And we have to be empathetic of that difficulty. For some people, not putting up a tree ever again or ever is perfectly fine. Like, bro, what do I need a tree for? For other people, even like in the born Muslim community, it's like, you don't put up a tree. It's like, you have to, uh, being a practicing Muslim does not turn you into a robot. You can be thoughtful, you can be knowledgeable, you can be practicing. But the forgotten sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ is that he was an empathetic figure. One of the more well-known stories, or there's two well-known stories that shows that this, the emotional intelligence and the empathy of the Prophet Muhammad ﷺ that we as Muslims are really lacking. We know the story about the man who came and urinated in the, in the, in the masjid. We know the Prophet ﷺ said, let him finish. That is emotional intelligence, it's, it's social intelligence, it's empathy. Don't just go beat him up while he's using the bathroom. That's the first thing that comes to his mind. Let him finish. Sometimes, you know, when people are deep in their feelings, we want to use that as a time to talk about holidays, talk about religion. But we need to let, we need to pick our spots. And that's one of the most important elements of, 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 of empathy towards people's experiences that we really need to adopt, picking our spots. While the tree is up and the lights are on and people are opening their presents, now is not the time to kick back and say, well, you know, this is all pain, you know? But the other side of this too, whenever people are, are deep in masia and in, in, in sinfulness, and they're not aware of a way out of it, kind of like the youth who said in front of everyone, in front of the Sahaba, the Sahabiyat, in front of everyone who was present, Prophet Wasallam, give me permission to commit zina. He's asking in front of everyone. He's asking for the Prophet to make it okay for him to be able to commit fornication. The Prophet he was kind, he was gentle with him. He gave him advice. He was practical. He, he did not shut him down. It's haram. Ah, you want to get stoned to bring four witnesses. He didn't do that. Sometimes we, we're not empathetic with the people who struggle with the gifts, with the hijab, with the prayer, with the holidays, with the customs. You know, I, I was Muslim or I was non-Muslim way longer than I've been Muslim. And I will need just as much time as a Muslim to undo all of the time that I had as a non-Muslim to get past some of those tendencies, to get to, past some of those mentalities, to get over myself. Uh, all those years of, of, of non-Muslimness, I, have to, I need just as much time to get over myself. Born Muslims, some of them spend a lot of time in a secularized, liberal mentality. They need time to also get past that too. Our family saw us when we weren't these things. 
they need time to get past that too. We have to be empathetic. And that requires a higher order of form of thinking. And then reconciling these Islamic stances with familial interaction in our own heart. Like, yeah, I love my mom. I love my father. I love my nieces. I love my nephews. I love my siblings. And I know I need to keep the ties of kinship with them. But in my heart, I don't feel comfortable seeing them open Christmas gifts. In my heart, I don't feel comfortable whenever they have the Thanksgiving dinner and they all say, let's, let's do grace. Uh, let's, let's say a prayer. A prayer for everyone's God, you know, this type of thing. It can be really, really hard to navigate. So again, to get to, to put our Islamic stances in focus, when it comes to familial interactions and even the turmoil that exists in our own hearts, we also need a higher order of thinking. And that higher order of thinking starts with maximizing submission to Allah and knowing that that is the path to the ultimate pleasure in this life and the next. True happiness, as opposed to trying to maximize everyone being pleased with us and compromising our submission to Allah through a mentality that says it's all about my intention, what I think and what I feel, and in the process, compromising our relationship with Allah and thereby jeopardizing eternal pleasure, which is heaven, which is what we're all in it for. And so, you know, I just want to take some time to address some of these uh, things that come up in, in these processes, right? Like the fiqh guarding of cherry-picked fatwas. Man, you know, uh, many Muslims are gardeners in today's age in the garden of fiqh. And we love the cherries of fatwas. And we pick those cherries according to our convenience. Brother, it, you know, it's a difference of opinion. Okay, tell me two people who differed. Tell me three people who differed. Just name five people who had a difference of opinion. Or tell me what the difference was, or was on. Was it a matter of usul, a foundational principle? Was it based on the interpretation of an eye or a hadith? Was it based on like something that exists within Madhahib? Was the, was the proof strong, but the majority was on one side or did the majority go with this? Uh, and, and the proof also reflects that, like based on what was it a difference of opinion? Oftentimes when people say this, they have no idea what they mean. They're just parroting what they heard or what they maybe, I, I opened three tabs on Google and I saw that I saw three different things. So it's obviously a difference of opinion. That's not how fit works. Sometimes the things that we think are differences of opinion Actually, they, they may not be. There may actually be one solid proof. But the way that we go about cherry picking it makes it seem like, oh, you can do this or you can do that. And then the next uh, thing in this fickle garden of cherry picked fats was this, well, this sheikh said it. So uh, <laughs> all right, wait, well, you think you're more knowledgeable than that sheikh? Uh, I don't see you with that many followers on social media. Uh, who are you again? Where did you study? Where did you come from? Uh, because this big time sheikh said this and... Uh, I'm going to just go with what they said. Look, maybe the sheikh said something, and maybe the sheikh is right, but maybe what the sheikh said, it's right textually, but contextually, it may be out of place. You know, if someone looks at you and says that Thanksgiving is not religious, and you come from a Christian background, where you know that there are a Thanksgiving uh, sermon, there's a Thanksgiving prayer, the church has a Thanksgiving event, we all do intercessory prayer for church, and you did it for 15 years. No one can look you in the face and say that it's not religious. Maybe the sheikh is not aware of how deeply ingrained uh, Thanksgiving is within the Christian community. So while the sheikh may be textually right, contextually he may be wrong. And that can happen. And it does happen. Another thing that we do in this fifth garden is, Allah knows our intention, brother, brother, sister, sister. It's all about the intention. Well, just going back to what we mentioned at the beginning, intention is deep. You can't just say, well, just because I, if you intend to punch yourself in the face for the sake of Allah, will you get hasanat for it? No, <laughs> you won't. Don't hit yourself in the face for the sake of Allah. <laughs> All right. So intention is important, but understanding and knowledge is equally important because a person can only intend as much as they understand. And then, and, and this is definitely a convert thing. Well, and Allah knows best. But at the end of the day, it's between me and Allah. Well, yeah, that's true. But surat al-mustaqim, ihdina surat al-mustaqim, that dua that we make in surat al-fatiha, guide us to the straight path, is a path that we're all on. So your path is not different than mine. Uh, Allah told us all what we should be doing. The, the sunnah shows us all what we should be doing. So yeah, it's between you and Allah, but your practice of the religion is not a, an exclusive one. It's not a you club and then everyone else is in their own club and we'll, we'll just be raised and whatever we did will be... No, 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 no. There's a criteria. And that criteria is Islam. And we cannot make up what that is. And one of the, the things that I find is probably the most difficult thing for a, a, a convert to deal with, speaking to their reality, is I'm not going to compromise my identity to be Muslim. And this can be that, uh, that big hurdle of submission. Like, look, I'm not going to compromise my, myself 
to be a Muslim. But you have to understand your best self is a good Muslim. That's why Allah gave us the gift of Islam. We have to pump the brakes on these preconceived notions on what we think is right and what we think is wrong. And we have to make sure that there are greater objectives than what we think and feel. The greatest objective for us as a Muslim is Allah's pleasure. And the reason is because seeking Allah's pleasure is the ultimate path to Jannah. Not, not doing what you're pleased with. You will be pleased if you do what Allah is pleased with. So prioritize knowing what he's pleased with in this time of the year and outside of it. Similar to how like uh, sometimes the only time we, we really try to practice our religion is in Ramadan. Sometimes the only time we make a difference between what Muslim Islam says and what everything else says is during this holiday season that compromises our survival odds during this time of the year. Adherence to the sunnah is for all people in all times in every single situation. If we follow the sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu then we will have Allah's love. And that's from the verse in Surah Ali Imran, chapter 3, verse 31, where the Prophet Sallallahu says that if you love Allah, follow me, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, is what he said. Allah will love you as a result of that, and Allah will forgive you of all of your sins. You will win. You will win this way. So seeing how does the sunnah help me navigate these times is really important because we have to understand the historical dynamic that Muslims, we are not the first group of people who have been an extreme minority in a, in a predominantly non-Muslim environment. That's why we have so much scholarship that addresses this. Uh, in any other expertise of medicine or, or psychology or astrophysics and whatever have you, uh, you trust the pilot to fly the plane. You trust the doctor to, uh, w when they give you a prescription. You trust the, the doctor when your child is sick. Why would you lean on your own understanding when it comes to how we approach Islamic academia and scholarship? So we have to make sure that we're deferring to Islamic scholarship on how we survive these times. And that is actually the, tr uh, the, 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 key, the, tr the true path to success. And just kind of giving you the, the novum, the synopsis of what do the scholars say about celebrating non-Muslim holidays? Because it's not just about history and it's not just about, well, people don't do that anymore today. There's six predominant criteria, and there's an additional four, but for the sake of brevity, we'll mention this here. And, and, it's, and it goes as follow, following. First is that it's not a distinguishing feature of non-Muslims. And when I say that, it means that this is something that only non-Muslims do, all right? And just to give you an analogy, genes are not uh, predicated upon iman or kufr, right? Genes are genes, they're clothes. It's a very general thing. Uh, you know, even like acknowledging New Year's as Muslims, even though like we don't really acknowledge the New Year, acknowledging a New Year is not a Christian. It's not like a specific distinguishing feature of non-Muslims. I mean, you could argue otherwise, but I'll tell you for sure, Thanksgiving is definitely a, a distinguishing feature of non-Muslim, regardless of if it's religious or not. Of course, its origins are religious. And of course, it is uh, also attached to the genocide of an entire demographic of indigenous Americans whose culture we conveniently forget about and replace with white culture or whatever the majority culture is or liberal culture or whatever have you. But one of the key things when it comes to how we navigate holidays is we don't want to uh, mix uh, our religious elements with so many secular elements that we can no longer recognize our own religion as a standalone doctrine, because this is a singular truth. The second is it cannot be religious, okay? Uh, in, in this country, 80% of the society identifies as Christian. That is the overwhelming majority. Eight out of 10 Americans identify as Christian. We are in a Christian predominant country. So the fact that, yes, there's separation of church and state, but don't lean on the understanding of someone who has no idea what Christians are, or what they believe in, or what they do annually to say what is religious and what is not. All you have to do is look at the Christians. I did a, an analogy with some uh, Muslim youth. I said, all you have to do is go on YouTube, type in Thanksgiving and Christian. You will see sermons, services, churches, thousands, millions of views, because this is a very important time religiously for them. <laughs> Don't say it's not religious. Don't make that up. Uh, the, we are not, an extreme minority is not an authority on the practices of the extreme uh, majority. All you have to do is look at them and they will make it very, very clear. Yes, this is very, very serious to them. Uh, another thing is direct references from the dean. We have many hadith, you know, there's thousands of authentic hadith. Uh, believe me when I say you've probably not heard most of hadith. You know, sometimes you say a hadith and a person's like, I never heard that hadith before. Well, there's more hadith that you haven't heard than there are hadith that you've heard. I can promise you that. And there are direct references in our deen about participating in festivals with non-Muslims, about 
giving greetings, uh, uh, you know, to non-Muslims during these times of the year for them. So we want to make sure that we're staying away from things that have clear direct references to the religion. Uh, another thing is you don't want to be engaging in the haram. You don't want to be, you know, everyone, you, you're drinking your apple cider and they're drinking their spiked eggnog, you know. Uh, you want to make sure that you're avoiding what is prohibited and displeasing to Allah. And there are also uh, clear hadith about avoiding festivals and practices of non-Muslims. You see how when the Prophet ﷺ, he found the Jews fasting on the, uh, uh, commemorating Yom al-Ashra whenever the uh, Bani Israel was liberated from the tyranny of Fir'aun. The Prophet ﷺ, he did not say, let's do what the Jews are doing. He said, we have more right to Musa than they do. And we should fast on that day and we should be different than them. We should fast the day before or the day after. And so you see how he saw non-Muslims doing something. He pointed out that it, religiously, we have a greater right to uh, uh, acknowledging the freedom of Bani Israel because we have a greater right to Musa than anyone else because he was a Muslim. And on top of that, we want to distinguish ourselves from them. He did not join the Jews to fast on Yom al-Ashura. He gave us a directive on how we as Muslims can honor it in a greater way. And that context is very, very important. And the sixth thing is necessity. Sometimes uh, in different eras, your lack of participation in some festivals could get you killed. Uh, one of the stories of the, the, the uh, Surah Al-Kaf, the 18th chapter of the Quran, is named after Ashab Al-Kaf, the people of the cave. If they, uh, you know, uh, they had to run away from the festival, that's how they got the miracle of being in the cave. That's what Allah had uh, commemorated their mention through that miracle of them leaving the festival of shirk and going there. We have the story of Ibrahim, where he, uh, you know, pretended to be sick so that he would not join the festival of shirk. So avoiding some festivals and practices uh, contextually is one thing, but maybe according to necessity, you don't have a choice but to do it. Uh, maybe like there will be a great deal of harm, a greater deal of harm of you not uh, participating in something than you do. And necessity is something that we always keep in mind. So we want to make sure that we avoid the specious uh, conversation of, oh, well, jeans, uh, should we not mimic non-Muslims in pants? Like, come on. We're talking about something completely different. We're talking about the aids of non-Muslims. We're not talking about pants. The priority for us as Muslims is always taqwa because taqwa is the key to our success. So we, uh, and we mentioned that in the Juma reminder that we gave two weeks ago. So we want to make sure that taqwa is something that we always are keeping in motion. And yes, alhamdulillah, we have access to a lot of scholars, but we also have to be uh, mindful that second and third generation scholarship in the United States may not have clear context of the perception of American culture and the religiosity of Christians or the practice of, of, of uh, sub-demographics of different spiritual groups in the United States, like people who channel or, you know, the law of attraction type of people and stuff like that. So bearing all of those things in mind, yes, defer to the scholarship, but also don't forget your experience, which is your expertise. You know, uh, you, you probably have more insights on how Americans vibe with these, this time of the year than maybe somebody who's sitting in the, uh, you know, the bubble of the masjid and never ever deals with non-Muslims or never will deal with non-Muslims during this time of the year. It's important that we have that balanced outlook because that's how we give context to these things. So that's kind of my uh, spiel in a nutshell when it comes to uh, navigating these holidays. But really, I, I want to just close with this point. Our key to surviving the holiday season, our key to surviving working with non-Muslims, our key to our non-Muslim family and everything is taqwa. Taqwa is the akhlaq, the behavior that you should be showing that will be da'wah to your, uh, your non-Muslim family members and your Muslim family members and friends. Taqwa, knowing what Allah is pleased with and doing it, knowing what Allah is displeased with and staying away from it, will be the key, uh, will be like the key in your speech. Yeah, have taqwa of Allah and make sure that your speech is always accurate. So now you don't have to get into a fiqh argument with your family and they don't even know what you're talking about, halal and haram. Just whenever you talk with taqwa, the truth will speak for itself because taqwa, it is kolin sadid. It is a, a speech that is always accurate. If we are uh, putting taqwa, knowing what Allah is pleased with and doing it, and knowing what Allah is displeased with and staying away from it, this will help us survive any difficulty in our life. In the holiday season, navigating Christmas, oh, well, what about my kids? And I'll close with this hadith. Aisha radiallahu anha, she narrated that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, hadith and sunan at tirmidhi, if you do something uh, to please Allah at the risk of displeasing the people, then Allah will be pleased with you and Allah will make the people pleased with you. If you do something to please the people at the risk of displeasing Allah, then Allah will be displeased with you and make the people abandon you.
Sometimes we are so willing to sacrifice key elements of our, of our religion and we lose sight of what is so important, which is our relationship with Allah. Prioritize that and you will find the solution in everything. But prioritizing taqwa will never make you extreme and it will never make you heedless. It will make you balanced. And we know that our religion is all about that. And that, inshallah ta'ala, is, is really the secret ingredient to survive in these times. So uh, I just wanted to, uh, to put all of that uh, forward, inshallah. And uh, that, that, that's my, uh, what was that, 25-minute spiel. <laughs>